All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, welcome to Culinary Conversations. I'm Ryan Bullheis, the Incubator Kitchen and Program Manager for the Downtown Market Grand Rapids. Uh, for those of you who are new to our events, uh, Culinary Conversations is a collaborative effort between the Downtown Market, uh, Start Garden, MSU Product Center, and Grow. Uh, the goal of Culinary Conversations is to shine a light on the West Michigan food industry, um, as well as educate, guide, and support food entrepreneurs. Uh, we do this primarily by hosting monthly events uh, where we have guest speakers and panel discussions on various topics that all relate to the food industry. Um, tonight is actually our second virtual event that we've ever done. Um, so the subject tonight is actually food photography on a budget. Um, our guest speaker is Darlene uh, Kuchmarczyk. Uh, Darlene has been a professional photographer for over 20 years. Uh, she's the former director of photography at Kendall. Um, Darlene has also extensively researched everything from food history to food photography, in relation to advertising, cookbooks, recipes, a little bit of everything. Um, uh, for tonight, the format, uh, Darlene has actually been gracious enough to put together a presentation. Um, during the presentation, if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments section on YouTube. Um, uh, if any questions do get left, we will also do a short Q&A at the end. Um, so from here, uh, I'll turn things over to Darlene. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you so much for asking me to uh, do this. I love um, talking about photography, so it's a great opportunity. And I also want to thank um, Mark for doing all the uh, dirty work behind the scenes for us. He's actually going to be running the uh, slideshow for us. And for those of you out there, I want to say thank you for making uh, delicious, wholesome foods that are locally sourced, and I'm anxious to try more of your uh, products sometimes in the future. Uh, so, Mark, if I could have the first slide, please. Okay. Uh, so, you know who I am. Ryan also tells me that um, this presentation will be available to you within a week or so. Um, so if you miss anything, if you'd like to review anything, please uh, feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna cover four topics at a pretty basic level. And I'm gonna start with the really sort of technical one. I know a lot of you don't know much, if anything, about cameras and camera operation. So we're gonna get the technical stuff over as soon as possible while you're still awake. Uh, then go on to some real simple lighting, uh, composition and styling of your photographs, and then um, hardware and software. We're gonna cover available light, um, um, artificial light, modifying light, color balancing of light, and all those sorts of things. Next slide, please. So whether you have or using just your phone to take photographs of your food and your products or a digital SLR, there's some really simple things that both have in common that you should know about. Um, next slide, please. Two controls. Again, this is the most technical part, so stay with me and please um, feel free to type in a question. If you have something, I'll try to keep an eye on the screen and on uh, the questions coming up. Two controls, the shutter speed and the aperture, both of which are preset on your phone. You might not may be able to make many choices, but some of you might have a DSLR or a digital single lens reflex, don't worry about what that means. Um, if you do, you've noticed numbers on the shutter speed dial, like 1 30th of a second, 1 60th of a second, 1 125th of a second. And as you might guess, the slower the shutter speed, the more light that's gonna come in and hit the digital sensor. The other thing the shutter speed can do is control motion, uh, make it seem like things are moving or like they're stopped. And we're gonna look at this little image of the strawberries in just a minute so you'll be able to see it better. Number two is the aperture. Again, preset on your phone. On a DSLR, you'll see numbers like F5.6, F8, F11, F16, F22. And this is the control that um, adjust the front to back sharpness of the image 
in the little flower photographs, the camera is focused on that front flower in both pictures, but by changing the aperture, you can choose to make the background very soft and out of focus or very sharp. Uh, next slide, please. The shutter speed. Shutter is like, let's see, where am I in my notes? Uh, shutter is like your eyelid. It's either open or closed. Um, when it's closed, no light gets in. When you open your eyelid, light gets in. It can show and stop motion too. Uh, I don't know how big this little image of the pinwheel is on your screen, but there are numbers under it from one second to, I can't even read by one, 160th of a second, something like that. Oops, there you go, that one. Um, and you can see that the at very slow shutter speeds, the pinwheel is not even visible, the separate colors, it's all one blur. The faster your shutter speed, the sharper those parts of the pinwheel look. Don't confuse focus or shutter speed though with camera motion, which is what's illustrated in the lower two photographs. You need generally a minimum shutter speed of a 60th of a second to prevent camera shake. We just can't hold cameras still that long. Camera shake is always indicated by overall unsharpness, like you see in the Eiffel Tower picture on the left. And we'll talk about tripods in just a few minutes. Next image, please. So showing and stopping motion with the shutter speed. Here's three pictures of sugar falling on strawberries. From the left, one second, one sixtieth of a second in the middle, and one one thousandth of a second on the right. For my money, the only one that actually looks like sugar is the one one thousandth of a second, where the grains are actually stopped in midair, as opposed to the one second, where to me that looks like water pouring. Um, maybe you disagree, but that's how I read it. Next slide, please. Here are some food pictures. On the left, a fast shutter speed, about 1 500th of a second, that stops that gravy pouring on the meat in midair. You can see the little droplets of the gravy. Contrast that with the right-hand image where the whatever the fluid that's pouring on the food is, uh, seems very silky and is one continuous stream of liquid. Next slide, please. The aperture in the camera is like the iris of your eye. Uh, when you go into a movie theater on a bright sunny day, it takes a few seconds for the iris of your eye to open up enough so that you can see in the darkened room. Same thing when you go back outside, the iris closes up. So the aperture of the camera never closes. It's always open, either a small opening or a large opening. You don't need to remember the numbers, but the, do, the thing you do need to know is that the larger that opening, the bigger the hole, the less depth of field, the less sharpness you have. I'm gonna explain depth of field in just a second. With a small aperture opening, like F16, F22, you have a lot of sharpness in the image from front to back. Uh, next image, please. Here's what depth of field means. Um, look at the two little drawings or little illustrations. In the top one, um, you can see the photographer is focused on that animal, I'm gonna call it a bear, I don't know what it is, um, that's so many feet from the camera. When using a large aperture opening, like f2.8, f3.5, he gets a very shallow depth of field. Only the a little bear's face and ears and maybe a little bit of grass in front and back is in focus. Contrast that with the bottom drawing where the photographer is focused on the same spot. That's called the point of critical focus. But using an aperture like F22 or F16, you can get the pine trees in front and back, the mountain in back, all in focus in the picture. Um, so 
Aperture is the most important way to control depth of field. You can also change the depth of field by focusing closer to get less depth of field or by using a different focal length lens. Focal length is like a zoom lens or a wide angle lens, something like that. But aperture is really the thing you need to pay attention to. Next image, please. Okay, this is so complex and I hope you have a pretty big screen. And this is as tough as it gets. Once you get through this slide, it's downhill all the way. In the top small image, we see a camera uh, focused on a scene of holiday decorations, two deer and some jingle bells, and then on the stool uh, behind it, there's some sort of thing with red lights on it. Look at the two sets of four photographs. In both sets, the left-hand image is a aperture of f 3.2, so very small or limited depth of field. The image on the far right in both sets is F22, so a much deeper depth of field. Things get sharper. And I just want to emphasize that the point of critical focus has not changed. The photographer is always focusing on um, the eye of the deer, the little deer that's closest to the camera. So it's not focus that's changing in the image, it's the uh, depth of field by using the aperture. Uh, no one's asked a question so far, so you, either you're asleep or we're going on pretty well. Next image, please. Uh, here are two food photographs, and on the left, a large depth of field. Now, this is an overhead shot, and it's a little easier to do a deep depth of field with this kind of angle uh, of the camera. By the way, when you're photographing a scene like this from above, make sure that the camera lens is parallel to what it is that you're uh, photographing. Okay, so that way you'll have the same depth of field, the same sharpness across the plane. Um, if your image is large enough, you can see that the rim of the glass with the green beverage in it, don't know what that is, uh, is sharp and the plates and the table are all super sharp. The right hand side has a shallow depth of field where the things in the foreground are not focused, the things in the background are not in focus. The sharpest focus is on the uh, the woman's arm, the food that she has in her fork, and in that plate. Uh, now, shallow depths of field can be really useful in making the viewer look at a certain part of your picture. But I wanted to use this particular image on the right because I think this is kind of a bad use of depth of field. I don't know about you, but I keep going back and forth to that um, looks like a cup white dip or something for the pizza that's right in the foreground. I find that very um, uh, annoying. Uh, and I would have made sure to eliminate that. So just a good way of saying no light colored out of focus things because they tend to draw our attention. Next image, please. These were supposed to come up one at a time, but totally okay. So hands. They're great. They add the human element. They can work as like leading lines to draw the viewer's attention to a certain part of the picture. But these are three different ways of using those hands that have some good and bad aspects. The left hand image, the two hands, the tattooed hands, I'm going to call them in arms. I think the proportion of space is poorly used in that image. Um, the, for, I know this is a generational thing. I think the tattoos are a little distracting from the food. And the food is really small in comparison to all the hands in there. And what is behind in the black area, behind the forearm at the top of the frame, what are those things? They have nothing to do with the picture and they're distracting to me. Now in the middle image, I think the hands are used very effectively. They're active, they're uh, drawing your vision to the food. The problem here, which you may or may not be able to see on your screen, 
is that the only thing that's sharp in that image is the gray sweater in the forearm that's coming up from the bottom of the frame. That's sharp. Everything else is out of focus. And that really bothers me. Now, in the third image, uh, the hands are really natural. It's a great way to, you know, you have to hold an ice cream cone uh, in your hand. I would say the background is a little bit too busy. On the other hand, it um, adds a sense of excitement. They're on the street. Um, they're, you know, um, part of the action. And so I think that can be a valuable thing. I would like them a little a little less busy, uh, in my opinion. Um, when I was preparing this presentation, I worked very hard to get any skin color other than white represented in these images. And so I was happy to find at least one brown hand in here. Um, remember who your uh, audience is, who you want to attract to your product, and it's not always young white people. Okay, next image, please. Yeah, I snuck in another little thing that you should know real fast. You've probably heard the letters ISO. Don't worry about what it stands for, but it has to do with how sensitive your camera sensor is to light. And in most cameras, some camera phones, you can change this. A large number is makes the sensor more sensitive to light. It's like your eye being wide open. That sounds like a good thing, except with that comes a reduction in image resolution, which is not a good thing. A smaller ISO number, 400 or below, is a little less sensitive, but has better image resolution. If you're only doing uh, social media design for phones, you don't have to worry too much about image resolution, but once you get to anything larger than that or print material, image resolution becomes a little more of an issue. Next image, please. Lighting. Uh, gonna look at large light sources, small light sources, and different colors of light sources, which is pretty important. Next slide, please. The larger your light source, the softer the light and the softer the shadow. In the right-hand picture, you can see there's window light. This happens to be a southern window. Uh, it's an overcast day, which is kind of perfect for this. Um, this kind of light is casting very soft, open shadows. The shadow cast by the plate and the pedestal. Uh, you can even still see the texture of the tabletop through that, so they're not uh, blackened out. Next slide, please. Here's another example. In this case, also using, uh, I think this was a south facing window, but it was a sunny day. So the light has to be modified, diffused, or made into a softer light source. I'll show you some very inexpensive ways of doing that. The easiest thing is a piece of white cloth, paper, a white t-shirt, there's lots of things you can use to diffuse the light source. This type of lighting, window lighting, directional, coming from one side but very soft, has been very popular in food photography since Martha Stewart popularized it, popularized it uh, back in the 1980s with her first book, uh, Entertaining. Um, it was a whole new way a non-studio way of doing lighting. It was pretty revolutionary at the time, but now it's become sort of the standard. Next slide, please. We are seeing more darker images, though, which are a little harder for the amateur to do, but I think they're, um, they uh, draw attention because they're the little less normal way of photographing things. Using this kind of lighting, you have a smaller light source. Um, the light is a little harsher and it casts dark shadows. For instance, in the food photograph, you can see the cast shadow of the slices of nut loaf, I guess it is, um, are totally dark, totally opaque. You don't see in them. And the bottom picture shows a studio setup that is probably not the first kind of lighting setup you want to use. But the main light source is on the right, 
It is diffused by a big white thing that's a gobo, a thing that goes between gobo, um, the light source and subject. And then a direct light source that's casting a shadow towards the camera. I suspect this is a shoot for, uh, looks like the assistant is going to be pouring the beverage into the glass. And I'm sure they're going to try to catch um, uh, the motion. Slide, please. You can see that the dark background in the direct light source is more dramatic. It does um, emphasize the shape, like the onion, very sculptural looking, I think, in that photograph. And it also, as on the right, um, can emphasize uh, the shapes of the stack of don donuts, I guess they are, and the bright pink of the top donut. That pink donut is called the hero. When you're making a lot of one food, you look carefully for the one that looks the best, the most picture perfect one, and that's called the hero of your shoot. Next slide, please. Every light source is different in color. And with food photography, neutral color lighting is super important because if you've ever seen those food images like from the 50s reproduced in magazines, color reproduction was so bad then that the food ends up just looking awful. You're looking for a light source that's most like direct sunlight right in the middle of this chart, about 4,500 degrees Kelvin. Don't worry about who Kelvin was or why the scale is made up that way. A low Kelvin temperature is yellow and then orange and then red. If you're walking down a city street at night and people have lights on in their home, they're yellow looking, right? Uh, if you find yourself photographing in the shade outdoors, you're probably getting blue images. Um, yes, color can be corrected with software uh, and some apps, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the best thing is to get the color right the first time. Next slide, please. OK, on the left, let me start again. Uh, again, since these came up all together, um, don't use white to judge color balance. All the plates look white in all three photographs. The one on the left is too blue, the one on the right is too yellow or too warm. And actually the photograph in the middle is the correct color balance. The foreground is that blue tone, it's intentional. Um, I think people would try to correct for that, but that, as you can see on the right, those waffles just get too, too intensely yellow. Uh, again. Try to get the best light and get the color right the first time rather than rely on color correction. Next image, please. We're going to talk about diffusing or bouncing light. I just wanted to illustrate that with, in this model shoot, the photographer is using a flash through a diffusing source. It's a translucent piece of material of some sort. I'll let you talk about those more in a minute. Next slide, please. Never use direct flash. Turn off the flash on your phone if you're using it. That goes without saying. And there are a couple of ways of using the flash on a camera, but none of them is, is really very good. This illustration shows on the left a direct flash, flash right at the subject, flat face. There's no modeling in her face whatsoever and very harsh shadows. In the middle image, you can see by the little illustration at the bottom, the photographer is pointing the flash up at the ceiling and back down at her. Her face feels a lot more rounded, but now we've got dark spaces under her brows and under her eyes. In the third photograph, the photographer is turning the flash towards a wall on the left. The light is bouncing back at her. Look how dimensional her face looks as opposed to um, 
uh, the first two images, and I just got a message saying that even though I'm plugged in, my battery's going to die. There we go. My cord was just loose. Sorry. Um, so diffuse light can really add dimension and shape to, um, to the things that you're photographing. Next image, please. I've totally lost my place in my script, so I'll just wing it from now on. A very simple way to bounce is to use a white card, board, paper, fabric opposite the window light source to fill in the dark shadows. At the top, you see the head of garlic. On the left, just using the window light, it's a nice soft light. But on the right, with the light bounced back into the right side of the head of garlic, you get a little more sense of dimension and more information in the shadow area. You can also see the photographers using what looks like to be an old metal trunk of some sort, which is kind of nice because you've got that reflection of the object in the, um, in the top. Pretty clever idea, I thought. Next image, please. This looks like a professional light setup, but it is so uh, budget friendly. Starting with the light, the main light source on the right, it's an LED light with variable power. These run um, about 50 bucks maybe, uh, but they're very, they can be very bright and can be used to light something much bigger than a bracelet. Uh, the move to a little orange, arrow in the center, it's pointing to a piece of foam core, which is just white, um, you know, you know what foam core is. You could use white cardboard. Foam core is great because it maintains its stiffness, but it's held in place with just a cheap picture easel that you can get, you know, steal from the back of your graduation picture or whatever, um, which is a, you know, a nice low budget way of doing this. And then the two little lights, are actually battery powered. That's very cool because they have cords getting in the way. LED lights, so it matches the color temperature of the main light source. Um, they're flashlights. They cost about five bucks, but they the light is diffused or softened with a piece of actually two pieces of plastic each. Um, cut out of a milk jug, so that like translucent plastic, they're cut to shape, and you might be able to see that they're attached with rubber bands even. So very low tech, very easy to do, but a very rounded light source. Next image, please. You don't see the use of colored gels very much anymore, but I could see there might be products where this would be useful, uh, particularly if you, you know, just want to add a little excitement to it. Um, this isn't a great example, but you can see in the bottom image that the pink light on the wall is cast by a light source behind the bottles facing the wall with basically a piece of pink plastic over it. Um, um, they're called gels, but you can use anything that's translucent. What I want to draw your attention to, though, is the upper left image. There actually is a light source on the background in that picture. You have to look kind of carefully for it, but it's casting this sort of circle of light on the wall behind the three green bottles that, again, you're not just photographing something in dead space. It really activates the three-dimensionality of that image. Uh, next, please. Composition and styling. We're more than halfway through. Uh, give me just a second to find, okay, here I am. Um, we're going to look at color as a way to draw attention, the shape of something, a focal point, which means the thing that you look at in an image, and some styling tips. Next slide. Do yourself a favor if you're not used to working with colors and print out something like this from the internet. This is called a color wheel. So just Google color wheel. And I'm going to talk about the three color schemes at, top and at the top and how to use that in uh, your images. 
monochromatic one color, analogous three colors that are directly connected to each other on the color wheel, and complementary. You've probably heard that term before. Colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. Next slide, please. Monochromatic schemes always work. They're calming. Um, this is just a, a, you know, just a group of browns all together. Very nicely composed imagery, calm. Analogous can be a little livelier. These are all colors that are near each other, uh, orange, yellow, and red on the color wheel right next to each other. Um, in this case, the photographer has used a cool color for the background that makes them pop, makes them a little more vivid. So he's doing both analogous and a little tiny bit of complementary color. Next image, please. So complementary colors are the way to really activate your scene. On the left, uh, we've got sort of that spring green and magenta colors that really are very lively, very bright. This picture also works um, compositionally because the, the beets and the tomatillas are arranged in a circular fashion that keeps your eye moving around that frame, doesn't it? And the image on the right, those are uh, true red and true green, directly complementary colors. It's very, very memorable. I'm not sure if it's selling food really well, but it's still a very interesting image, I think. And before we leave this slide, I wanna um, tell you that the space where the table and the wall meet each other is called the horizon in a photograph. It doesn't have to be a landscape scene to have horizons, just that line. And that's important as we go to the next slide, please. The most common compositional device, learn it, use it, and then break it when you need to, is the rule of thirds. This rule just says if you take the space that you're working with, divide it into thirds both horizontally and vertically. This works for a horizontal image or a vertical image, doesn't matter and place the focal point, the thing that's most important, at the intersection of those lines. In the photograph of the couple, you see their faces, human faces are always drawing attention, right at the intersection of um, those lines. And in the lower right image, the dog's head is in those lines. This picture also has um, a great leading line, a road that leads us from the top, in the top center part of the image all the way off the edge, adds dimensionality. And oh, I wanted to point out in the first picture of the couple, look at where the horizon line. It is deadly boring to put the horizon line right smack in the middle of the picture. If the top of the picture is more important, put that horizon line low or vice versa as we see in the next slide. Please. Um, high horizon on the left because the flowers were, were more interesting. A low horizon on the right because of the colors in the sky. Um, so again, both of these images use the rule of thirds very effectively. Next slide, please. Uh, leading lines. This is a compositional device to draw the viewer into the photograph. Um, the uh, terrific photographer Ansel Adams at the upper left, uh, his photograph of the Tetons with the Snake River, this beautiful curve that leads us to the background. Uh, famous image you might have seen, Raising the Flag on Iwo Jima uh, by Joe Rosenthal. Um, that Strong diagonal is always very active. Lines in composition are based on the human body. Upright is very uh, stable because we can stand upright. A hor horizontal line is relaxing because when we're laying down, we're relaxed. But diagonal lines, because we can't hold our body on a diagonal for very long, are much more activating. 
And then at the bottom, uh, wonderful Henri Cartier-Bresson's photographs. It's so active with very simple compositional structures, but the orange lines sort of show you how your eye works through that image. Next picture, please. Framing is another compositional uh, device. Um, each of these photographs uses framing in a different kind of way. At the lower right, uh, the scenery picture actually uses the arch of the stone to create this whole another picture, a little mountain picture inside of a picture. That is literal framing. I'm going to see that um, in just a minute in some food photographs. Um, the left, the black and white image of the modernist house uses dimensionality to frame. There are three levels of information here, a foreground, um, a midground, which is where we see the people in the house, and then a very interesting background, uh, which is the uh, lights of a big city at night. And in a sports photograph, um, we have a bunch of runners moving into the space in the frame. This photograph would be very uncomfortable if the right hand edge were much closer to the runners because it seemed like they were running into a wall. This type of framing leaves room for the action to move into. So if you are depicting anything that's moving in your photograph, give them some space to move into. Without the two observers on the right, this photograph wouldn't be balanced though. It would be very left heavy. So you need those two figures to sort of make the picture feel comfortable. Next image, please. The focal point. What do you see first? Obviously, the, in the left picture, the red apple, because it's different from the other things around it. It's a different color, and so it's isolated. It's um, where the photographer wants us to look. Color is a great way uh, to create a focal point, and a bright color is the best way. On the right, it's a much more subtle composition. First of all, don't ever feel a need to enclose everything with the edges of the frame. Don't just put something in the center of the frame and not use the rest of the space. Don't be afraid to crop off half a top, half of a plate like we see at the top of this image. But the lines are created by uh, the person's hands, the cutlery that's all facing in the same direction to really bring us, bring our eye from the lower right of the image up towards the top, the plate of food. Uh, they're also using pretty neutral background, pretty monochromatic, monochromatic, pretty gray cloth and gray table surface. Uh, I think the woman is even wearing gray sleeves, woman or man, whoever they are, um, to sort of draw, let the, the color of the food uh, jump out at you. Next image, please. On the left-hand photograph, the even though there's a lot of colors and a lot of stuff going on, it's those red tomatoes that I stick with because it's a really, really bright color. This kind of center placement can be kind of dull, can be kind of like ho-hum, but there are things, subtle things going on. The little um, silver pewter pitcher in the upper right the spout is pointing back towards the plate to bring us back in that direction. Even the fork is tilted in towards the plate. Our, you know, we look at uh, the splatters of paint on the, um, the wooden background, but then we always go back to the food. I'm unsure about this image. I don't know if I like the splatters of paint all that much, but personal taste, I think, is I'll um, we'll leave that there. On the right hand, it, image. We have um, complementary colors, again, a very light pink and a very light blue, so pastel complementary colors, which we haven't seen before. And by isolating that, 
I think it's a donut or a cupcake, I'm not sure. Um, by isolating it in space, you really draw um, the viewer's eye to it. But this photographer didn't see a need to show the whole thing. We know what we're looking at, even if part of it's cut off. I think it makes the image more, more interesting um, to the viewer. Next image, please. Here's some food photographs using that framing and isolation idea. Let's start at the bottom right one. The white square bowl literally forms a frame around, I don't know what the food item is in there. I'm not sure it's a finished dish. It might just be ingredients. Um, so we have a frame within a frame. The photographer has tilted that square bowl so it's not lining up square with the frame of the image. And then activated with some spilled spices from a jar and from a spoon on the right. Um, on the upper left image, the red cup of coffee, cocoa, whatever it is, the saucer literally becomes the frame, even though it disappears into a pretty deep shadow, it's becoming a frame for uh, that food product. And the cup and saucer are pretty centralized, but the frame is active because it's the background, look at the background, half light, half dark. So it doesn't seem so centered to us. Next image, please. If you're doing product photography, um, first of all, let me, I just, I'm not a lawyer, but I have a couple legal tips for you about uh, product photography with food. Uh, the U.S. Uh, federal food law says, quote, consumers are not to be deceived by advertising claims, unquote. Now, what that means is that the thing you're selling has to be the actual thing. Many uh, food photographers use substitutes for things like ice cream, which would melt over time under lights. Uh, they use Crisco and sugar or mashed potatoes and Crisco and a couple other things. That's fine if that bowl of ice cream is a prop in the background and you're selling chocolate sauce. That's just fine. Uh, if you're selling cornflakes and you use white glue for the milk, which they do, uh, that's fine. As long as the cornflakes are the actual cornflakes uh, you're selling. So I hope you get the idea of what, you know, what's sort of legal to do and what's not legal to do. If you're photographing a product or packaging, try different angles. With a flat box like this, the picture on the left of the wood chip smoking kit, whatever that is, um, is much more informational than the one on the right, which really highlights the front blank edge of the box. Uh, and it reminds me of pizza too, so that good. In the middle two images, show the product when you can. It's a much more interesting shot to have uh, the mustache wax. Is that what that is? It's really tiny on my screen right now, can't really see. Uh, and in the lower two images, uh, this wooden box, uh, this uh, chipboard box evidently has several boxes inside it. Instead of just taking those items out and showing them next to the big box, open up those boxes, show us what's inside the packaging. So it also looks like if I'm spending $25 for the stuff on the left, I feel I'm getting a better value than $25 for the stuff on the right. So, I mean, that's the way our minds work. The more stuff, the better value. Uh, next image, please. Uh, it always is a good idea to show us what's inside the package or what it's made of. Um, I think this is actually a brown sugar candle, hence the, the sugar. Um, I'm not sure the packaging for this item says candle, so... In the left picture, I might have taken the lid off of it. Um, and in the right image, the point there is to say, if you can show a lifestyle or some sort of context where your product might be used, that can be a big sales influencer. That being said, this picture on the right is pretty horrible. Um, sorry for the photographer. Um, 
Those green and blue books are too distracting. They become a focal point. The white and brown just repeat the white and brown of the lower part of the image and just totally don't add anything to it. I can barely tell what it is. And then I also think that the uh, platter that the candle is on looks like a uh, paper doily to me, which just doesn't, you know, say high class, I guess. A uh, next image, please. Hardware and software are coming down to the end. And this is probably the part that I think, I hope, uh, might be the most interesting to you. Um, I think, okay, so next slide, please. You need a tripod. Uh, it is really, you're going to be using slow shutter speeds or low light at some point, but you don't have to spend a fortune. If you have a DSLR, you can buy a used tripod. There's so many, you know, they're, they're kind of a dime a dozen. You don't need to buy a new one. For a full-size tripod, like we see in the top ad and the bottom ad, I'm not doing ads for Amazon. They're just quick ways to show you different kinds of equipment. Um, heavier is better. Bigger is not always better, though if you're working in a confined space, you don't want the spread of the legs to have to be too big to hold the camera up. But you can see these are two really reasonably priced full-size tripods. If you're using your camera, you absolutely need a little gizmo like this one in the middle. I thought this was pretty uh, cute in that um, it has a remote control for the phone, which could be very, very helpful when you've got everything meticulously balanced on a tabletop and don't want to be, you know, touching the back of your phone to release the shutter. Um, it says it's universal. I have no idea. I would check into it before purchasing that. But this seems like a really nice little bendable tripod good for camera phones for both horizontal and vertical images. Um, and certainly not, not pricey at all. If you've got more money, you can get more fancy gizmos. That's, that's great. But uh, I know you want to spend your money on your product, not on all these um, other tools. Next image, please. If you have a digital single lens reflex, a good camera, quote unquote, um, it probably came with what is called a kit lens, which means it's a fixed focal lens. Uh, you can't zoom it. I think everyone knows what zoom means. What you really need is a large aperture zoom lens. And I found, uh, reconditioned zoom lenses for digital cameras are a very good value because there's not a lot of moving parts. Um, as long as the glass isn't scratched, there's really not a lot that can go wrong with a lens. So I would look for a warranty on any used product, but um, they can be really good values. This lens, um, and again, I'm not, when I started photography, which was way more than 20 years ago, actually, Ryan. Um, uh, I was a Nikon person. I loved Nikon cameras. But in the digital age, Canon has really passed them up. There's still two wonderful brands. And there's uh, Olympus and a couple others that um, are really good, too. But Canon is re has really led the way in digital cameras. This is a zoom lens that goes from f3.5 to f5.6. Oh, uh, depending on what zoom you're using, it can go down to f3.5. That's good. f2.8 or 1.8 would be even better. But a zoom lens with an f1.8 aperture is going to be very expensive unless you can find one used. Please make sure that any used equipment you're buying is compatible with your camera body. There are three generally used mounts where the lens attached to the camera body, but um, 
sometimes an uh, older model of a cannon won't use the bayonet mount that they use now. So just uh, double, triple check to make sure that what you're buying is compatible. And even better if there's a return policy, if it doesn't work for, for some reason. Um, next image, please. This looks kind of rinky dink, but these are great. This is called basically a, a, a soft box or studio box. This is a very small version. They come in a variety of sizes. And what this is, is a for small products, um, it can make it look like the background doesn't exist. It's called an infinity background. Looks like it just goes on. Uh, look, you know, 20 bucks it comes with all these different color backgrounds. I actually have one. I use the black, the white, and then I use fabrics. I use wallpaper. I use all these things that I make myself that can clip in just fine. What's nice about these kinds of things is convenience. It has a strip of LED lights across the top front. Some of the little more expensive ones have two strips, one in front and one in back of the box, the top of the box. That can be really good um, if, if you um, need a slightly bigger box or photographing bigger things. Notice that you can photograph from the front, like we see illustrated. If you look closely, there's a little circle on the top of the box that's removable um, so that you can shoot straight down at an object too. Um, the one I have, which I couldn't find an image of, is collapsible. I thought that would be useful. I never collapse it. It just sits in my studio set up all the time. But it has snaps on it. You can fold it down flat again uh, if you need to. Um, if you go to the next slide, these are um, what I do. I'm actually making jewelry now, metalware, uh, metalware jewelry on Instagram. Um, and so the image, the earrings on cardboard are straight on in that little box and the earrings on the right are looking down through that opening. I did forget to mention that most of them don't have electrical plugs. They end in a USB plug, so you'll need that little cube adapter to actually plug it into uh, the wall. I, I didn't find that. I had an extra one, so you can buy them. But just... I just wanted to point that out uh, to you. Next slide, please. If you remember back when we started talking about lighting, there was a photograph of a photographer holding a flash, photographing a model, and she was using one of these uh, reflectors. That's what they're called. You don't have to buy something like this, but I can't believe the price of these, these things were probably $150 when I first started in photography. They come in various sizes. I'll tell you what they are in just a minute what to do with them. This, uh, these are collapsible. They sort of fold up into a small disc, and there's usually a bag that they fit in, so they don't take up a lot of room. But depending on how big the object you're photographing is 32 might be too big. There's bigger sizes and there's smaller sizes. This is kind of in between. But it comes with five discs. One of the white ones is uh, uh, translucent, so you can push light through it, like we saw in one of those first images where window light was being diffused. You want to take a little light source and make it as soft and big as you can. The other white one is just white for bouncing light. Uh, we saw an image where a person was using a piece of white cardboard to bounce light. The white one of that would work, um, of these discs would work for that. A black one to stop light, like to darken something for a little more moody atmosphere. The gold one to reflect warm light. Um, and a little sparkly light into a subject if you had a liquid. And the silver does the same sort of thing with a cooler sparkly uh, light to it. This, this, I think, is a really fair price for what these are. Um, and they do last forever. But once again, you can go to an art supply store and get a piece of 
um, uh, gold crescent board, silver crescent board, black and white uh, for just a few dollars. You do not need to invest in something like this. You can do it very, um, uh, very low key uh, if you'd like. Next, software. Um, we're going to talk just a little about both of these. Whether you're using computer, a computer program or an app on your phone, if it's designed to manipulate photographs, it's really helpful to have some sort of color and exposure adjustment. On the fancy programs, this is called levels or curves, um, which is the best way of manipulating exposure because it doesn't just make uh, an image lighter or darker, you can control, you can make the lights, uh, the whites lighter or darker, you can make the midtones lighter or darker, and you make the darks lighter or darker. So each range can be controlled separately. So that's a really great thing. Uh, usually that's only available at a software program. Perspective control, you want things that are square to look square so the edges don't um, you know, go off into space. So perspective control is really helpful. Cropping and rotating, I'm sure you know what those mean, both important. Uh, vignetting, um, there's lots of times when using uh, a softer, darker, it used, vignetting used to just mean darker, but now it means a soft lightness around the edge, a soft darkness around the edge, um, or a soft focus around the edge. Uh, all of that can be done with certain software programs. And HDR um, stands for high dynamic range. Don't worry about that. If you were photographing inside a house, if you've ever taken a picture inside of a house that includes windows, you might notice that the windows are blown out if the house you know, is light enough or uh, the house looks real dark if the window light looks good. HDR is a software method, uh, actually it's in the hardware, method of taking several pictures at different exposures and merging them all together to get the best of both worlds. Every real estate picture ever taken now uses HDR. If you ever uh, look online for homes and real estate pictures, you know, the, the photography is just miles above what it used to be because of HDR. And the next slide, please. So really quickly, Adobe Photo, Adobe really has cornered the market on manipulation of images and they do a fabulous job. Photoshop is only available as a, as a subscription now. You can't buy the software. And it's not expensive per month, but if you use it for years and years, you're going to end up paying seven and eight hundred dollars for the program. Lightroom is a little less expensive. It does many of the same things. I'm a Photoshop addict, though I've used it since it came out, and it's an amazing program, but it's costly. Camera apps, on the other hand, are free, or sometimes there's a small charge if you want to upgrade a little bit. And they do amazing things, particularly if you're using your phone as your primary camera. Um, it's one called uh, Photoshop Camera. Uh, that There's some requirements, as you see, listed there. Let me preface this by saying I haven't been able to actually test any of these because my phone is too old and I can't upgrade my operating system. Um, but I did a lot of research, so I think I'm pretty comfortable talking about them. That's a great application for the phone. It's free if you have a newer phone and the correct operating system. Very popular application called Visco, VSCO, which is getting less popular. It really relies on a lot of filters. Um, uh, and I think it's sort of reached its heyday and gone down in popularity some, but it's you might want to take a look at it. Uh, Snapseed seems to be designed for Android phones. Again, there are the operating requirements uh, that you need for that application. And uh, the one I'm really excited about is Adobe Lightroom CC Mobile, 
Uh, again, you have to have an updated operating system. And I've included, I have looked at a lot of YouTube videos about this camera app and came away just loving this woman, Joni Simon, the, uh, the biteshot.com, is that what she calls herself? I would look for this video on YouTube called How to Shoot Food on Your Phone Like a Pro. The big thing I liked about it is that everything she says is right. I have seen dozens of YouTube videos with incorrect technical information. So I want to make sure that I'm recommending to you something that is absolutely correct. Um, uh, the other thing I like about her is that as she starts, she's very approachable, very, very simple. She starts talking about something you don't know about. She'll say, we have a video on this and she'll point to the, uh, the link to it so that you can you know, go on and see a bunch of different videos. But this one is all about using uh, Adobe Lightroom CC and I find it extremely clear. Um, and uh, um, I, I do, I recommend it highly, mostly for its accuracy. And our next slide. I want to say thanks for your time, and I hope that we have some questions. Uh, Ryan, do you want to take over the or join the screen? Here you are. Thank you again, Darlene. Uh, that was such a great presentation. Um, I can't say how much I learned from that. I mean, uh, I come from a cooking background, so I didn't know a lot about photography anyways, but uh, no, that was great. Thank you again. Um, so uh, as Darlene mentioned, uh, we'll move into our Q&A section now. Um, uh, let's get the ball rolling with some of the questions that came in uh, during the presentation. Um, Aaron, uh, one of our guests, uh, one of our viewers is asking if you have any um, suggestions on the best way to capture steam or to photograph clear liquids. Uh, um, real quickly, steam, dark background, uh, try both. I would try slower shutter speeds, 1 30th, 1 15th of a second, uh, and make sure you're using a tripod. Clear liquids, same sort of thing, dark background. That's kind of the key to making it appear like something rather than an empty glass. Okay. Um, and then Mark is asking, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to shoot for different online mediums? Uh, for example, photos versus, for Instagram versus photos for Pinterest or Facebook? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, to me, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, they're both, neither, none of those require high resolution. So that's not an issue that I think is important. Um, I think more it's the vertical versus horizontal format. That's a real different way of viewing the world. I don't know if you've been getting these ads on your phone for vertical cinema. There are filmmakers that are shooting with camera phones in a vertical format. And um, it, it's really a very different thing. So th that's the first thing that comes to mind. If something else comes to me uh, in a minute, I'll add that. But um, the way you arrange your space, I mean, like just looking, at least on my screen, at you and me, Ryan, is that um, a, a vertical image is much better for us. God, I can't even get to there we go. <laughs> uh, for what we're doing right now than a horizontal. It's it's a kind, kind of a dull use of the space. Sure. Okay. Um, Mark H. is actually uh, wondering uh, if you have any advice for photographing jars of sauces, like honey mustard, for instance. Ah. Uh, uh, I'm looking, uh, money, is that the name of your product? Thanks, Mark. Um, do you, my question, can Mark, Mark can hear me, right? So he can answer back. Yeah, Mark, yeah. are you showing the product or just the packaging? I think my answer would vary depending on that. I know there's a little delay. Are we getting anything from him? Not right now. Would you be able to okay. just kind of talk about the differences? Um, sure. Um, 
in general, I think showing the product and some of the things that go into it, grains of mustard seed, um, uh, you know, a little pot of honey for honey mustard are uh, in, make for a much more attractive picture. But if it's just the product that you're photographing, I suspect that would be for uh, a reason like if any of you are working with uh, graphic designers doing things for packaging, uh, they might need a, like a neutral background that they can cut out um, and insert in another file of some sort, another digital visual file. Um, soft diffuse lighting. Uh, if your packaging has any shiny surfaces, you want to avoid hot spots or bright spots like I'm getting on my glasses all the time, mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things. Um, I think that's kind of it. Sure. Um, and then Ryan B, not me, um, is uh, wondering if you have a recommended DSLR camera that is good for beginners. Uh, a lot of the Canon line. Uh, oh, did I see a picture of Ryan? Hi, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the Canon Rebel is a really popular, well-priced beginner camera. Um, since I've been retired three years, I you know things things in cameras change really fast in models. Um, if you live right, if you live in Grand Rapids, which I'm assuming you do, uh, the people at Norman Camera are really knowledgeable. That doesn't mean you have to buy from them. Uh, Go in and spend some time looking at different cameras. Uh, size hands might make a difference. Uh, some people prefer a smaller, lighter camera. Some people prefer a heavier, sturdier feeling one. Uh, it's like chefs talking about a chef's knife. You don't know which one is right for you until you go and feel it. And I, I think that applies to cameras, too. Um, if I may interrupt, Ryan, for one second, mm -hmm. there was I want to mention that I didn't. Um, if you're real uncomfortable with photography and or graphic design, please consider going to one of the local colleges and ask in hiring a student. Um, Kendall College of Art and Design, obviously, Grand Valley, uh, even GRCC, although I know less about them. Um, always have students needing work. Uh, please never ask a student to work for the exposure, in other words, for free. Uh, pay them student rates, sure. You can get really good work for less than $20 an hour, which I think is a, a, a fair wage. And they have access at their schools or universities to all sorts of lighting equipment. They can do a really nice professional job. I would say that... Um, at Kendall, at least, a student at the second semester sophomore level could do pretty much anything you could want um, at, at, a, at a decent price. And the same for graphic design or logo design. Uh, Kendall's got a great graphic design program. Um, it's just I'm familiar with you know, those, that school, so I sure, keep sure. talking about them. But it's a great way to get... Uh, uh, you know, take a little of that burden off your shoulder mm -hmm. and get some good work at a decent price. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. really nice. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, I was, I was uh, Darlene, if you could talk a little bit about um, the, the impact that, that the right crew photography for your product can have on, on your advertising, even your sales. Oh, absolutely. I think that there's nothing that's, I mean, food is really, I think, kind of easy sell because it's so darn appetizing looking. Um, uh, you know, when you think of television food advertising, you've probably at some point, I hope I'm not dating myself, seen a soda commercial where the they're opening a bottle of pop uh, or soda um, and you hear the fizz that just makes you thirsty, right? Um, sound and visuals are... are ways of understanding the world and they can be they can communicate so much um i think it's when you're looking through a lens it's really hard to look uh 
objectively at what you're seeing. I always take a picture, um, print it out if you happen to have a cheap color printer, look at it on your larger screen. The, the back of your phone is just not good enough to really sort of judge what's, um, what's there. And as I mentioned before, I'll reiterate that correct color is what makes food look luscious because it just doesn't look good if it's too warm or too cool. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, unless anybody else has any other questions, uh, I think we'll wrap it up with just one more quick question for you, Arlene. Uh, for entrepreneurs out there who might only have the option of only using a cell phone camera, um, is there, what would you say is the best tip specific for that type of camera that, that you'd be able to get them? Um, buy that little tripod to hold it steady because it's really hard to hold the camera so you keep your fingers out of the way of the lens. Oh, you know, if you're using, unlike a real camera, your phone is in your pocket, in your purse, and that lens gets really dirty. So make sure it's clean. Uh, don't use like those tissues that you clean your eyeglasses with, they have silicon in them, so don't use those. A uh, clean white t-shirt is the best way to clean your camera lens. Um, and make sure that you recognize that the camera is not, uh, set, I can't do this backwards. The lens, that's it right there, is not centered in the back of your camera. So you're gonna to need to shift to the right or to the left. Um, and I think that paying attention to that is important with the phone too. Sure. Uh, well, one more question did come in. I think this will actually be a really fun one to end on. Um, but uh, Aaron asks, uh, what makes you cringe in food photography? <laughs> oh, that's a really good one. Um, <laughs> I have to say, in general, not to avoid your question, Erin, but in general, people are so image savvy compared to, uh, I look at 1950s food photography a lot, and so much has changed in the past 60, 70 years. But um, I think unnecessary items that are distracting particularly in the foreground, an item that is out of focus in the foreground can make me crazy. I just want to swat it out of my way. <laughs> Get that thing out of there, particularly if it's light colored. Um, and too much. Um, I remember getting uh, years ago fashion advice to you know, get dressed to go out and look in the mirror and the first thing you see, take that off because that's the thing that's overpowering, it's too much. That's probably more for women than men, but I think that applies to food photography that people tend to overdo and simple is better. Sure, that's great advice. Uh, well, again, thank you, Darlene, so much for uh, being a part of our conversation tonight. Um, on behalf of everyone from uh, Culinary Conversations, uh, we really hope that you found tonight's event really educational and helpful. Um, if you are interested in joining us for our next event, um, it'll be Wednesday, September 23. Um, our guest will be award-winning author and journalist Eve Turo Paul. Um, Eve will be discussing topics from her award-winning book, Hungry. Um, Eve will also actually be offering a 30% discount um, on her book for anyone who would like to purchase it prior to the event. Um, so if anyone would like to register uh, or for the event or uh, needs to find the link to the book, uh, please head to our Culinary Conversations meetup page. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ryan and Matt. Thank you all.